this one weird CPU instruction. Or maybe you will, I don't know. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about pop count. So what's pop count? Pop count, or population count, is um, an instruction that counts the number of bits set in a machine word, so usually 32 or 64 bits, that's set to one. So for example, and for illustrative purposes, I use eight bit words. The pop count of the first word is three, because three of those bits are set to one, and the pop count of the second word is two, because two of those bits are set to one. So I was like, is that it? That is, in fact, it. That is all it does. <laughs> so my second thought, obviously, is hi. Who cares? It doesn't seem very useful. So in contrast to something that you would imagine is not very useful, this instruction has been in instruction sets from the 60s dating to the present day. So what's going on? So I dug a little deeper, and it turns out what is going on is, in fact, the NSA. So pop count is known as the NSA instruction, and there's a, a news group, a comp.arch thread, I think, called the NSA instruction that discusses the story of um, how it, the NSA decided that it should have this instruction. And there's this great story in a, in, a, in a separate related thread about how every time they came up with a new mainframe, like they'd set one aside and an unmarked truck would drive up, pick it up, and drive off into the distance, never to be seen again. So that's pretty cool. But why does the NSA need this instruction? So to answer that, I'm going to tell you about the concept of Hamming weight. So a Hamming weight is you take a string of some alphabet, and alphabet is a set of possible symbols, and you count the number of symbols that are not the zero symbol. So for um, binary strings, which are just ones and zeros, this is exactly pop count. So why would the NSA need this instruction? So, and uh, again, this is, all this is all rumors and speculations. I have no idea what the NSA actually did with this instruction. But a source that I read on the internet said that what it did <laughs> is that it would take an encrypted message, it would split up that message into lines, and for each line, it would try to count the number of distinct characters in each line by setting a bit in a word. And the CDC 6000, which it, one of the machines that it did this on, had 60-bit words, which were enough for like this operation. So it would set the, set the words, do a pop count to figure out how many characters there were, and they'd use that as a hash, or they'd store it, or they use it for further cryptanalysis or something. I don't really know. Um, so if you were paying attention when I talked about all the instruction sets that it was in, it kind of existed in the 60s, and then it kind of disappeared, and then it came back in the 2000s. So the conspiracy theory here is that the NSA like, su purposely suppressed its inclusion in consumer CPU instruction sets until recently. And um, again, that's a cool story, so I thought I'd mention it. But like, if, it, if it's really true that this is the only thing that it's useful for, like, why would it come back, right? So talk about something else that it's useful for. I'll talk about error correction. So um, Related to the concept of Hamming weight is the concept of Hamming distance. So you have two strings of equal length. You count the number of um, positions in which the strings differ. And again, for binary strings, it turns out you can do this very easily with two operations, XOR and pop count. So you, like these two strings, for example, you can see that they differ here, and they differ here, and they differ here. That's three, and the pop count of that, num that byte or like is three. So great. So what is this useful for? So one thing you could do with this, for example, is you could send some data over the wire. Um, compare the data that you received with the data that you started with, see how it differs, and use that as an estimation of the error rate. That's useful, and then you can turn this around. So suppose you find out that uh, you, like one bit gets flipped in your, um, like on average. So what you do is that you design things so there's at least three bits of distance between the symbols that you use to encode your message, and then you can, error, and then you can recover, because um, that's how far away they are. So that's cool. Uh, another thing you can use them for is binary convolutional neural networks, which is, which is a lot. So let me, go, let me go through this. The binary, so most neural networks, from what I hear, they use 32-bit floating point numbers to encode the neural network. But you don't have to use 32-bit floating point numbers. You can instead use ones and minus ones. And in this case, you code minus ones and zeros. What's convolutional? Not really sure. Something to do with matrix multiplication. Uh, what's a neural network? I have no idea. If you, find, if you know, <laughs> please come and tell me afterwards. But anyway, why would you need these for binary convolutional neural networks? Turns out that, oh, so I already need binary convolutional neural networks for it in the first place. So if you're using a desktop CPU and you're doing machine learning on it, it's fine. You know, it's whatever. You can just go ahead and do that. But if you're using something like a router or a smartwatch or a mobile phone, it's really useful to be able to do something that uses less power and is more efficient. So what you do is then you take your complex neural network, you split it up into a couple more layers. Uh, and because each of those layers is so much simpler because they only use ones and zeros, it's much easier to get um, results faster, which is really useful for small devices. So how do you do uh, matrix multiplication with binary convolutional neural networks with uh, pop count anyway? Turns out you can use two instructions. You can do XNOR and you can do pop count. So you take two matrices, you XNOR them, um, you do the pop count, uh, and then you take the length of one of those matrices and you multiply, like, and you subtract, you subtract it from two times the pop count. And um, 
This is, there's a source for this, which references some Apple documentation. So if you're interested, like, that's there. So there's a bunch of other fun things you can do with PopCount. You can use it to, uh, so if you're interested in chess engines, so most chess engines these days use what's called a bit board representation. So they represent a bit or some, uh, sorry, they use, um, they represent some attribute of a board as a series of ones and zeros. If you want to do useful things with that, PopCount. If you're interested in molecular fingerprinting, so this is very related to our error correcting code example from earlier. So what do you do instead? You turn the, you turn a molecule into like some kind of signature, which is a, ones, a bunch of ones and zeros, and you want to compare them, pop count. You can use them for hash array map trees, which are a fun persistent data structure, which is how I originally learned about them. So the challenge that you're trying to solve with hash array map trees is that you have essentially a tree, but it has multiple things at each level. You can have up to 16 things at each level. But you don't want to allocate 16 slots of space when there's nothing there, or there's just one thing there, because that's incredibly wasteful. So what you do instead is you have a bitmap, and the bitmap has bits that are set in it when, uh, corresponding to the number of elements that are in the array, and the array grows and shrinks as you need. So if you want to update that index or query that index or whatever, you end up needing to use popcorn. Uh, the most fun uh, thing that I think you can use popcorn for is seeing data structures. There's this really interesting new field of research where you um, try to figure out how you can store data in as little space as possible, but still not have to decompress it first before you do useful work with it. So what that means in practice is that you have basically a bunch of ones and zeros, and you have indices over these ones and zeros that allow you to figure out how many ones are before a certain position and where the fifth one is, for example. And uh, if you want to create these indices or create these indices or work with them, pop count. In fact, pop count is so useful that if you go ahead and try to naively implement pop count, both GCC and Clang will just go ahead and like swap out your implementation for the built-in pop count. I can show you this in practice, actually, because we have this cool tool uh, now called uh, the Compiler Explorer. So this is uh, GCC 9.1, the most recent version of GCC. You can see that it just took my naive implementation pop count. Clang has been doing this for much longer. It's been doing this since Clang 3.7. And in fact, um, a friend of mine, Michael Malice, who will be speaking tomorrow, uh, went ahead and found out, found out where in Clang this is actually happening. So there's this function called detect pop count idiom, which will <laughs> to go ahead and like swap out your pop count. It's like Clippy, right? It's like, I noticed you're trying to implement pop count. <laughs> So I think of PopCount as this really fun, weird, like, instruction that ties a whole bunch of disparate computing disciplines together. And uh, that's essentially it. That's all I have for you. And if you're interested in looking at these slides later, clicking on any of the source links that I had, this is where you can find them. Thank you.